was just past 10 p.m. when I pulled into the driveway of the rental property. The realtor had told me it'd be available to view anytime, and I figured a nighttime visit would give me a better feel for the place. I'd been searching for a new apartment on Craigslist for weeks, desperate to get out of my cramped studio downtown. As I stepped out of my car, the cool night air hit my face. The house was a small, two-story craftsman style, painted a faded yellow with white trim. The porch light was on, casting a warm glow over the front steps. I made my way up the creaky wooden stairs, fumbling with the key the realtor had given me earlier that day. Once inside, I flicked on the lights and began to explore. The living room was cozy, with built-in bookshelves and a brick fireplace. The kitchen was dated but spacious, with plenty of counter space. As I ran my hand along the smooth granite, I couldn't help but imagine myself cooking meals here, maybe even hosting dinner parties. I was just about to head upstairs when I heard a noise coming from outside. It sounded like footsteps on gravel. My heart rate picked up a bit, but I told myself it was probably just a neighbor. Still, I double-checked that the front door was locked before continuing my tour. The upstairs had two bedrooms and a small bathroom. The master bedroom had a lovely bay window overlooking the backyard. As I peered out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of movement near the fence line. I squinted, trying to make out what it was, but it was too dark to see clearly. Just then, my phone buzzed in my pocket, making me jump. It was a text from my friend Anne. Hey girl, you still checking out that house? Want me to swing by? I breathed a sigh of relief, grateful for the distraction. I texted back, yeah, I'm here now. It's cute. Come take a look if you want. I made my way back downstairs, feeling a bit more at ease knowing Anne was on her way. I decided to give the kitchen another once over while I waited. As I opened and closed cabinets, testing out the space, I heard another noise. This time it sounded like it was coming from right outside the back door. My pulse quickened as I slowly turned towards the sound. Through the small window in the door, I could make out a shadowy figure standing on the back porch. Before I could react, there was a sharp knock that made me yelp in surprise. Hello? A man's voice called out. Is anyone in there? I froze, unsure of what to do. The voice didn't sound threatening, but something about the situation felt off. I'm the landlord, the man continued. I saw a car in the driveway and wanted to make sure everything was all right. I hesitated for a moment before responding. Oh, um, yes, I'm just looking at the property. The realtor gave me a key. There was a pause and then, mind if I come in? I'd like to show you around, answer any questions you might have. A wave of unease washed over me. Why would the landlord be stopping by so late? And why didn't he use his own key to get in? Actually, I was just about to leave, I lied. My friend is on her way to pick me up. Another pause. Are you sure? It'll only take a minute. I can point out some of the unique features of the house. I started to back away from the door, my heart pounding in my chest. No, thank you. I really need to go. Suddenly, the doorknob began to jiggle violently. I let out a startled gasp and stumbled backwards, knocking into the kitchen island. Let me in, the man shouted, his voice no longer friendly. I know you're in there alone. Panic seized me as I realized the back door didn't have a deadbolt. The flimsy lock wouldn't hold for long. I scrambled to grab my phone, my hands shaking as I tried to dial 911. Just then, I heard the sound of tires on gravel, followed by a car door slamming. Hey, what are you doing? A familiar voice called out. It was Anne. The jiggling of the doorknob stopped abruptly. I heard footsteps retreating quickly from the porch. Are you okay in there? Anne yelled. Should I call the cops? I rushed to the front door, unlocked it, and flung it open. Anne was standing there looking concerned and confused. What happened? She asked, as I practically fell into her arms, sobbing with relief. Between shaky breaths, I managed to explain what had just transpired. Anne held me tight, her own body tense as she scanned the area around us. Let's get out of here, she said firmly. I nodded, too shaken to argue. As we hurried to her car, once we were safely inside Anne's place, she insisted on calling the police. I gave my statement, feeling a mix of embarrassment and lingering fear as I recounted the events. The officer assured us they'd look into it, but without any real evidence of a crime, there wasn't much they could do. I spent the night on Anne's couch, jumping at every little noise. 
Sleep eluded me as I replayed the incident over and over in my mind. By morning, I was exhausted, but determined to get some answers. I called the realtor as soon as their office opened. When I explained what had happened, she was horrified. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, she said, her voice filled with genuine concern. That definitely wasn't the landlord. He's out of town this week, which is why I was handling the showings. A chill ran down my spine as the full implications of her words sank in. Whoever that man was, he had been lying. And he had known I was alone in the house. The realtor promised to file a report with her agency and alert the actual landlord. She also offered to set me up with some other properties to view, but the thought of going to look at another strange house made my stomach churn. In the days that followed, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder. Every time I came home to my studio, I triple-checked the locks. It took weeks before I felt comfortable enough to resume my apartment search. Even then, I made sure to only view places during the day, and always with Anne or another friend in tow. The incident had shaken my sense of safety in a way I'd never experienced before. I ended up finding a nice apartment in a secure building with 24-hour surveillance. It costs a bit more than I had initially budgeted, but the peace of mind is worth every penny. Still, there are moments when I catch a glimpse of someone who resembles the shadowy figure from that night, and my heart starts to race. I know it's irrational, but part of me feels like I narrowly escaped something truly horrific. It happened last summer when I was working as a pool cleaner in New Mexico. I'd moved there from back east, trying to start fresh. The dry heat and wide open spaces seemed like the perfect place to clear my head. I'd been picking up odd jobs here and there to make ends meet. One day, I was scrolling through Craigslist and saw an ad for a pool cleaning gig at some fancy mansion way out in the desert. The pay was insane, like suspiciously high. But I was desperate for cash, so I figured what the hell. I emailed the contact and got a reply pretty quick. The owner said he was out of town but gave me the address and gate code, said to let myself in and get to work. Looking back, I should have been more suspicious, but like I said, I needed the money. So the next evening, I loaded up my beat-up pickup with supplies and headed out. The sun was already setting as I drove further and further from civilization. The road turned from pavement to gravel, then to dirt. My GPS kept saying, recalculating, until it finally just gave up. Just when I was about to turn around, thinking I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere, I saw it. This massive adobe-style mansion rising up out of the desert like a mirage. The place was huge, way bigger than I was expecting. Must have been at least 10,000 square feet. I punched in the gate code and drove up the long, winding driveway. There were no other cars around, no signs of life. Just this sprawling house all alone in the middle of nowhere. I parked and grabbed my gear, trying to shake off the uneasy feeling in my gut. The backyard was impressive. Manicured lawns, fancy landscaping, and a huge infinity pool overlooking the mountains. But something felt off. The water was cloudy and there were leaves floating on the surface. Didn't look like it had been cleaned in weeks. I got to work, scooping out debris and checking the pH levels. The whole time, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. I kept feeling like I was being watched, but every time I looked around, there was nothing there, just the empty house looming behind me. As it got darker, I switched on the pool lights. The blue glow made everything look eerie and unreal. I was about halfway done when I heard it, a loud bang from inside the house like a door slamming. I froze. I tried to convince myself it was just the wind or the house settling. But then I heard footsteps, heavy, deliberate footsteps coming from inside. That's when I knew I had to get out of there. I started gathering up my supplies as quietly as I could, planning to make a run for my truck. But before I could move, the patio doors slid open. A figure stepped out, tall, at least 6'5", and built like a linebacker. But the thing that made my blood run cold was his face, or lack of one. His head was completely bald. I stood there, paralyzed with fear as this thing slowly walked towards me. In his hand was something long and metallic. A crowbar, I realized with growing horror. My fight or flight instinct finally kicked in and I bolted. I sprinted across the lawn, my heart feeling like it was going to burst out of my chest. 
I could hear him behind me, those heavy footsteps getting closer. I made it to my truck and fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking so bad I could barely get them in the ignition. Just as I got the engine started, something smashed into my driver's side window. The glass spiderweb but didn't shatter. I stomped on the gas and peeled out, gravel flying. In my rearview mirror, I saw the figure standing in the driveway, watching me go. I didn't slow down until I hit the main road, my hands white-knuckled on the steering wheel. I drove straight to the police station, still half convinced I was going to wake up and realize it had all been a nightmare. But the shattered glass in my truck proved it was all too real. The cops were skeptical at first. I'm sure I sounded like a raving lunatic babbling about faceless men and mansions in the desert. But they agreed to check it out, probably just to humor me. I gave them the address and gate code. The next day, two detectives showed up at my door. They looked grim. Turns out, the mansion was a stash house for a major drug smuggling operation. The pool cleaning ad had been a setup to lure in victims. They think I interrupted a break-in attempt by a rival gang. They found evidence of a struggle, but no sign of the guy I described. The detectives warned me to lay low for a while. I don't know why. A week later, they called to say they'd made an arrest. They showed me a photo, and I knew instantly it was him. Same huge build, same terrifying face. I should have felt relieved, knowing he was locked up, but I still can't shake the fear. I keep having nightmares about that smooth, featureless face. Sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat, convinced he's standing at the foot of my bed. I moved away from New Mexico not long after. Couldn't stand being anywhere near that house. So yeah, that's my story. Pretty crazy, right? But then I look at the scar on my hand from the broken glass, and I know it really happened. I haven't really talked about it before now. Too scared people would think I was making it up or going crazy. People told me the cops found a room in the basement of that house, said it was set up like some kind of torture chamber. Gave me chills just hearing about it. I'm driving at night and see headlights in my rearview mirror. I get that same panic I felt fleeing down that long driveway. Logically, I know he's locked up. The detectives assured me he'd be put away for a long time. But a part of me is always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like maybe it was all an elaborate ruse and he's still out there somewhere. A few months back, I found myself needing a place to stay. My job at the warehouse had cut my hours and I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. I was scrolling through Craigslist when I came across an ad for a room in a house not far from where I worked. The rent was cheap and the guy posting seemed normal enough, so I figured why not. I met up with the guy, let's call him Mark, to check out the place. It was a small two-bedroom house on the outskirts of town Kind of run down, but livable. Mark seemed like an okay dude, maybe a little quiet, but nothing too weird. He told me he worked nights at some factory and mostly kept to himself. Fine by me, I'm not really the social type anyway. So I moved in, and for the first couple weeks, everything was pretty normal. I'd see Mark in passing when our schedules overlapped, but we didn't talk much beyond a quick hey here and there. I noticed he spent a lot of time in his room with the door closed, but I didn't think much of it. To each their own, right? It was about three weeks in. I came home from work one night and found Mark sitting in the living room, staring out the window. He didn't even look up when I walked in, just kept staring. I said, hey, but he didn't respond. I figured maybe he had headphones in or something, so I just went to my room. The next morning, I woke up to the sound of Mark pacing back and forth in the living room. It was like 6 a.m. on a Saturday way earlier than he usually got up. I poked my head out to see what was up, and he was just walking back and forth, muttering to himself. When he saw me, he stopped abruptly and just stared at me for a second before going into his room and slamming the door. That day, I noticed Mark's car was gone. I didn't think much of it at the time. Figured maybe he went to run some errands or something. But as the day went on, I started getting this uneasy feeling in my gut. Something just felt off. That night, I heard Mark come home really late. He was making a lot of noise, slamming doors and stuff. I was half asleep, but I swear I heard him talking to someone. The weird thing was, I never heard anyone else respond. The next few days, Mark was acting even weirder. 
He'd spend hours just staring out the window when though barely moving. Sometimes I'd catch him looking at me when he thought I wasn't paying attention. It was starting to freak me out, but I told myself I was just being paranoid. Then, about five days after, everything changed. I was sitting in the living room watching TV when Mark burst in, looking panicked. He was all sweaty and his eyes were darting around like he was looking for something. He asked me if I'd seen her, but when I asked who he was talking about, he just shook his head and locked himself in his room. The next day, there were cops at our house. They were asking about Mark, showing me a picture of some woman I'd never seen before. Turns out, she was Mark's girlfriend, and she'd been missing for almost a week. I told the cops everything I knew, which honestly wasn't much. They searched the house but didn't find anything. They told me they'd be in touch if they needed any more information. That night, I couldn't sleep, trying to figure out if I'd missed some obvious signs. I mean, the guy had been acting weird, but I never thought. The next morning, the cops were back. They'd found the girlfriend's body dumped in some woods outside of town. And get this, they think she'd been dead for at least two days before Mark even started acting strange. I couldn't stay in that house another night, knowing what had happened. The cops are still investigating, but they seem pretty sure Mark's their guy. They can't find him though. He disappeared right after they questioned him that first time. I keep thinking about those days after he started acting weird. Was he planning to do something to me too? Was I living with a killer and didn't even realize it? You never really know someone, even when you're living under the same roof. Stay safe out there. Think twice before answering that Craigslist ad.